Hello, I'm John Kennedy. And I'm Deborah Bell. And we're from Radiant Press, a local publishing company. And we're going to present some readers for the virtual version of the Cathedral Village Arts Festival. But before we do that, it's time to acknowledge uh, some sponsors of the festival. Uh, we'd like to thank the City of Regina, the Saskatchewan Arts Board, SAS Culture, SAS Lotteries, Rocco Radio, and Canadian Heritage. And there's a, a lot more sponsors of the festival, and you can find a complete list of them at the uh, Cathedral Village Arts Festival website. And there's also the option of supporting the festival through an online 50-50 draw this year. And you can find that at uh, www.arts5050.ca. And just before we get started, we'd also like to acknowledge that this reading is taking place on Treaty 4 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I'm excited. Great. <laughs> Who's first? Our first reader will be Bruce Rice, the current Saskatchewan Poet Laureate. He'll be reading from a Radiant Press book called The Vivian Poems. Hi, this is Bruce Rice. I'm the Saskatchewan Poet Laureate, but I'm also a poet living in the cathedral neighborhood here. And I'm so happy to be participating in this virtual uh, festival, which starts, which takes place about half a block from my house. I'd like to start with a poem that I wrote about the Nest Creek Folk Festival, the music festival up in northwestern Saskatchewan, which uh, the forest up there covers two thirds of our province, actually. And so this is just a tune that I wrote uh, when I was up there and our kids were up there and everything else. So here it goes. Sometimes, in the right place, a chair in the middle of a field, say, next to a creek that flows through a valley plumbed with pine. As you lift your green fiddle, start simple. St. Anne's real, why not? Others will join. Orange blossom special, woo-woo, laissez le bon temps rouler. The chair, the music, a cardboard box shuffle. As daddy, won't you take me back to Muhlenberg County? down by the Green River, where paradise lay. These woods are partial to doublets, triplets. The E string of the heart struck as 10,000 blue dragonflies dance, each with its own continent of air and our faith in the perfect moment. Then one more song and one more, a girl, a black horse, a cherry tree, and the desperate things love says or does how the heart never stops, or when it does, another starts up, just as the field overflows itself, then a clearing opens. The tune's just a slow breath, drawn over the reed of memory. Aspens assemble, the empty chair listens, and it's only a question of where we go from here. John Prine, your job is safe up there in heaven. <laughs> uh, and if you're playing a harp, I'm sure it's a harmonica. I'd like to, uh, next I'd like to read a few poems from my new book, The Vivian Poems. Street photographer Vivian Meyer from Radiant Press, just out in February. And this is a book about a street photographer who worked as a nanny for families in uh, especially in Chicago most of her life, but she came from New York and has some New York photographs. And two years before her death in 2007, a whole group of 140,000 black and white negatives, prints, there were a couple of boxes of rolls of color, photo, uh, color film. There were Super 8 films and audio tapes. And when those went up online, uh, Basically, the internet went crazy. They were posted on, um, I believe, Instagram. Um, or, but in any case, it was uh, people immediately wanted to see more. 
and Maya herself died in poverty, but uh, right now there have been, I believe, five full, very thick books of her photographs, over 60 international shows, this book of poetry, but there's also been one biography and another on the way, as I understand it. So it's, this is within 10 years of um, when the work first became known. So what I'd like to do is read, and she was a hoarder, she lived alone. And in fact, in one of the houses she lived in, the weight of the books and everything else in her room actually caused issues with the floor and the people who owned the house had to put in posts to support it. So this is, but this is her. And she says, a slip of paper in a stack of self portraits says light, remember? In a corner I shield from the sun, so sudden, so deep, there is no place I cannot go, except for one I try not to think of. Happy is such a meaningless word. Everything casts a shadow. It's all smoke and mirrors, mostly a mirror. What I ask is, don't look at my legs. Don't look at my body. If I come close, don't touch me. I'm not a planet. I'm not a pair of shoes. But maybe I am. Maybe I am. And the next poem is called A Necessary Question. And it features, um, she mentions a number of her photographs sort of indirectly, just some of the images from them. But it's about how she works and what she's thinking about as these photographs are happening. But the necessary question, she asks, is this. What makes us human? Only a rich person would ask such a thing. Even an ant knows what it is. Are you an ant? Maybe God put us here. Maybe it's luck. I'm like that Dane who deduced how electrons work, that we can be streams or waves at the same time. He kept a horseshoe over his door. Of course, I don't believe in it, he said, but I understand that it works whether I believe in it or not. As for the world in six days, from the shape we're in, I believe it. First we chip stones, attach them to spears. Soon, given our nature, we'll blow ourselves to smithereens. We're no better than monkeys digging with sticks. Does language make us smart? I've had better conversations with birds than I have with some people. Better stick with the horseshoe. But humanity, that's the real question. I'm a difficult case myself. I sometimes wonder why the universe bothers. I walk, I take pictures with my beautiful boat Rolly. How many faces pass through the lens? A thousand? Ten? Ten thousand faces. I never thought to count the people clinging to doorways, posts, or each other. A Negro boy wearing Mickey Mouse ears looks directly into his future. A picture like this fixes itself in your mind. But why? I should be terrified. I've seen the tableau of an accident, certain appalling acts, but also this exhausted Canadian mother who cradles her son, royal blue stag knitted coolly into his siwash. Blue for a sleeping boy, something as people made by hand. His pretty mother is not a Madonna. She'd be a woman like me if I weren't single. I saw a statue with lines and a movement like this in St. Peter's, the stone transparent. This mother is too, but most of us don't think of ourselves as works of art. My roly shoots from the waist. Through it I see like a child who is not very tall and from whom much can be learned. Digging graves is a job and often quite pleasant. We seldom think of the birds and the sunshine. There are a few kinds of punishment, a hundred kinds of shame. Whatever happens, we cool off with Kool-Aid. 
a man removing his shoes in a park is memorable. A boy who has never heard English can look over broken slats of a fence, pickets topped with peeling fleur-de-lis, and we can tell by his gaze that in some places the only language left is on the graves. It's a full-time job. In some other life you can call me broken. But one thing I know, water is a mirror. If in spring God were to walk by a puddle in Battery Park, even he would pause to look at his reflection. But what could he do? There is too much to fix in 10,000 lives. All we can do is put up with it. It's why I never ask people to smile. Myself, I don't ask for anything. There's a section of the book called 1968. And that was one of uh, Meyer's most prolific years. And it's also a horrific year. And within a six month period, we had the assassination of Martin Luther King, the shooting of Bobby Kennedy, and the disastrous uh, Chicago Democratic Convention, which uh, police uh, were brought in and militia were brought in to uh, quell the protests, anti-Vietnam War protests. And so the question is, what did Vivian make of it? So there were riots all over the United States in various cities, including Chicago. So this is, this is called After the Riot, Chicago West Side After the Shooting of Martin Luther King. Too expensive to be ashamed. Cameras detest and loveless. A war zone. A word to attach to the six o'clock news. Black Panthers, juvenile youth, the blacks and their gangs. Six o'clock faces explain. But gangs don't do this. Two miles of Madison gone. Flags downtown at half-mast for King, or maybe for this, pathetic. My cover is a nanny riding alone, past basements still smoking as walls kneel into them. No flags here, but the bus still runs, gasping at each stop in the weird silence. Whites take seats by themselves, read the Tribune, or stare out the window. It was no easy dream some lunatic ended. At California and Madison, I get out and walk west. Other women walking as if they are lost. There's something they urgently need but can't think what. It's a strange addiction. I look in the remains of houses. People still believe if there is no photograph, it didn't happen. Funerals, weddings. And this, it's foolish to think my camera will keep me safe. Two boys on bikes dressed quite neatly. One says, we just wanted to see. 10 years old, but now it's the place where the memory happened. Shoes, bloody clothes, caps in the park and everything left behind. I keep my nerve. I know what moves me. A yellow backhoe with its scoop on the ground, a posture of mourning that both is and isn't true. Except for the reflex in front of the camera, not smiling, no. Two city workers eating a sandwich, they seem relaxed. There's no hurry and some jobs never get done. Outside her store, this white woman poses her grown son, too, as if they're in prison. They don't know what they'll do. It's calm, but maybe the west side is not done erupting. And they're slaves with no way to flee this bewildered Roman holiday town. Mother and son, food for the ashes. The poor I know work all the time. Three jobs at least. Hawking in stalls in December, boiling or freezing, cleaning hotels, 
Do I need to describe it? Picturesque faces which left of themselves would say, we're fed up. The city's on fire, are really on fire. A committee can't fix it. Maybe they'll shoot and maybe they won't. This is a terrible flaw of a lie and what it looks like. And um, I th a lot of people think of Meyer as a street photographer, but she actually, nature also plays an important role in a lot of her, her shots. And this is called um, Proofs of Winter, which anybody in Saskatchewan doesn't need a very much of an explanation for. So here's uh, the final poem. Snow, nothing more, as cracks in the walk show through like veins under skin, a sign for the kind of intimacy that buries its scars, slips beneath the talk, 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 and finds its way, a kind of rest, like spaces left in the tracks of birds, without loss, without words. Two resolutions. To look out the window more often, to know the difference between smalt blue and cobalt, which came later, and how the colors we invent are still true colors, known all along to the first light that hits them. So it seems to me that my pictures of things are true things, real as ice on a clump of hawthorn berries, the same ruby flesh the same burden. Between storms, wings lift the intentions of birds, a whir of precision as roofs disappear in snow-piled plains pierced by a steeple, the iron bell stilled to a kind of perfection, an assurance in the heart there is such a thing, a kind of ease. Things I know I know by walking through them. This is why we have seasons. Our strangeness is to want to see what is new as the world comes out of darkness. Sometimes a cirrus wisp in a deep sky blooms and fills with itself, pushed as I am, walking through to the end of it. And if this wind, with its reasons, takes me, then we are even. So thanks, good festival folks, and Bernadette, and Ven, and Randy, <laughs> also my partners in this gig. So everybody, have a good festival, and don't forget all to check out all the artists and musicians. And over to you guys. Thank you, Bruce. That was awesome. And harmonica, too. That was pretty cool. I liked it. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> Let me rattle this paper a little bit more. Our second reader is Randy Lundy, and he'll be reading from Field Notes for the Self, published by U of R Press. Hello. It's uh, good to be with you today um, in this format. I'm going to be reading some uh, poetry from my latest book. Um, it's called Field Notes for the Self, uh, which was published in March 2020 um, by the University of Regina Press. So the poem I'm going to read is called Kint Sugi. Um, and if you don't know, um, that was a Japanese uh, form of repairing broken porcelain. Um, they would create a lacquer. Um, they put gold dust in it and uh, paint paint the porcelain back together. So it was a, a, a way of repairing broken porcelain. Um, the poem is called Kintsugi, and it's for my friend Nathan Mader. And incidentally, I should mention that it begins, uh, this is a gross egotism. It begins with a quotation from uh, an earlier poem of mine. Slate gray, late autumn sky end of October, and rain, light drizzle, but as thick in the air as the aphids were just a week ago when the weather was still warm. And you know you have written that phrase before. 
you are repeating yourself. All the stories you tell are the same, not even slight variations these days. This is how much your life, your seeing, has narrowed, contracting like molecules of moisture as the temperature drops. Only a handful of words, like the tiny black dried seeds you gathered from the lupine today. Now you sit in the chill of the house, the fire unlit, staring out the window, watching a wolf spider trapped between the inner glass and the outer screen. And you tell them over again, like counting and recounting beads on a mala. Your teenaged father, not yet quite a man, blackening the eye of his mother with his fist down at the barn, while his father was away in town to buy some nails, or sitting in the hotel bar drinking foam-topped glasses of beer with his buddies from the war until the resurrected memories blurred, or your mother away binging for three days in the bars of that northern mining town before returning to your father with his fists clenched, heavy as ball-peen hammers that he put to work putting her in the hospital or your brother stealing your money and car after a night of drinking in the Berry on 20th Street in downtown Saskatoon. How you tracked him down at a house party the next day and didn't hit him even though you wanted to. Hanks, I'm so lonesome I could cry, barely audible through static on the radio and the swaying bodies of strangers everywhere when you took your first deep pull from the neck of the Jack Daniels bottle. Slate gray, late autumn sky, you say, Burden, burdensome as memory, as the weight of flesh, skin, blood, and bones, and your mind again today, spinning like a wheel in the mud. And what exactly have you said? That the sky is heavy, gray, and cold as stone? You expect anyone to take that as an adequate metaphor for your spirit, your soul, fine-grained, foliated, homogenous, metamorphic rock, clay and volcanic ash, everything that you are. Listen, my friend. Yesterday, I sat on the back deck with a cup of coffee and a cigarette, the three dogs jumping and barking at the circling of a half-dozen broad-winged hawks just above the tops of the spruce trees, all of them the rare dark morph. And it's true. I felt something close to joy. Maybe it was simply a kind of peace. I don't know, and I am comfortable in that unknowing. I remember just something in me lifting like a wing, rising like the voices of the dogs as they leapt and danced on their hind legs. Something in me was pieced back together like fine but shattered Chinese porcelain bowl, not healed, just not quite broken in the same way anymore. This one is called Naming the Moon. Um, and it's a, a short, short lyric poem. Um, and it's largely about uh, our failures, uh, failures in our attempts to, uh, to name the world. Naming the Moon. The moon is not thin as a fingernail, clipped. Not quicksilver quick or embryonic slick. Maybe pale as some woman's wrist, veined blue, not like a bruise, not that dark, not dew at dawn or a sliver of pearl. Still, there it is, moored in the black branches of the white pine, cool and biding its time. Here's a poem called uh, Desire, Meditation for the Spring Equinox. A month ago, a snowy owl in the middle of the grid road when you were driving home after dark, its eyes two perfect full moons in the headlights as you slowed, before it lifted its too thin, almost spirit now body into flight, disappeared into the February snow-dark stubbled fields. Spring now, cottonwood creek and thaw, you watch a doe move slow as afternoon light, her curved hooves leave quotation marks in the soft, clay-banked hillside. The language between those bar marks now vanished, now silent. Her dun-colored body concealed in the stand of aspen and birch behind the faded, broken barn in the distance. 
You wonder if affliction is nearer to the truth of things. No, neither closer nor farther than beauty is, you think. Today, the memory of all your dead drove you to your knees. It is the best place from which to see the beetles in the dirt, each a black hard-shelled casket that will bear your flesh into the next world and the next. Study that, practice that kind of knowing. As a child, you tried to live inside the sound of river water flowing over stone, but the world called you back. Now, the path has become narrow, very narrow, but not secular, not that, not quite. There are no deities to bring home, only a red field stone, a white river stone. But what more could you wish? Plant wolf willow, plant buffalo berry. The moon tonight cut in half. How did this happen? You suspect the winged maple seeds. Perhaps their turning blades, after carving the blue afternoon, continued their fall through the body of the earth, out the other side, into that world, sliced the moon like a ripened fruit, orange. You know this cannot be true. You know these are only words. You know metaphor does not change what is. Still, your destitute eyes, your mendicant mind, gather it all in, grasp at some teaching from the seeing. Perhaps you are in search of a self. The world answers back in its own time, in its own way. After midnight, unable to sleep, you stand on your front deck having a cigarette. Somewhere the sun crosses the equator. Down the dim-lit street comes the single-eyed, half-max, feral cat. He could teach you a thing or two about the nature of suffering. With his coming, the wind rises, sings the old songs, is torn from the branches of the elm, flayed like the fringes of a ghost dance shirt. I'm just going to read the uh, last poem in uh, Field Notes. Um, because it has a long, confusing title that I can't make any sense of, so I'm hoping somebody else will be able to. It's called Lines with No Opinion Regarding Indigenous Mythical Realism. How to explain that the two jets of hot air blasting in your face come from the nostrils of a buffalo standing before you in the darkness of the lodge? The wings of a large raptor beat in and brush against your left ear and fireflies flicker in and out of existence, subatomic particles, before your wide open eyes. Why would anyone believe these things if you cannot yourself believe? Some things should not be talked about, not talked about in poems. Isn't that what you've been told? Still, you speak here only to the dead or the nearly so. The buffalo are gone long ago, back to the dust and ash of the prairie, feeding the grass that once fed them. And you too, my friend, are gone across that great river. Stone by stone, the water walks into the distance. This world is not your world anymore. As you read these words, you too, reader, are fading like the light at dusk across the open broad fields. In the blue cliff record, you read, in one, there are many kinds. In two, there is no duality. Of course, you think. You've always known this is true. You want to write letters to Plato, Boethius, and Augustine regarding the medieval problem of universals. Invite them to sit with the old man from Carry the Kettle who runs the sweat. He could tell them a thing or two. Nonsense. Nonsense, you say, dear reader. How is it that you and I have met here on this page? How is it we have met this day? Did you know I came here specifically to meet and tell you that a peregrine in its black executioner's hood sat on the power pole just beyond the back fence this morning while I smoked a cigarette and sipped some coffee? The air was thick with mist at 6.35 a.m. when a slight breeze swept aside the veil and there perched the bird. Remember, I speak here only to the dead or the nearly so. Time to put these words down. Return now quietly to our other lives. 
Thank you, Randy. That was awesome. Randy Lundy is a good looking man. He is. He is. What do we got next? Our next reader is Ven Begamudri, and he'll be reading from his recent book, The Teller from the Tale. Thank you to Deborah Bell and John Kennedy at Radiant Press, to Tanya Wolf and Nina Paley for all their splendid work. This book, The Teller from the Tale, contains three long magical stories. I'm going to read chapter one of the first story, which is called Ahmad's Gift. Amar lived in a village on the shore of Moon Lake in the shadow of Far Mountain. He was a gentle young man. While his brothers worked ankle deep in water or mud in hot sun or pouring rain, he sat in the shelter of their widowed mother's house and carved. But what he carved? Shaped by his downlight fingers, a block of wood became a hummingbird, a stone became a rose, a grain of rice, a snowflake. At sunset, his brothers returned from their paddies and argued over which of them had worked hardest. When they reached their mother's house, they stopped under the eaves to examine Amar's work. They forgot their aching arms and stiff legs while marveling at his skill, though they otherwise cared little for him. The longer they marveled, the lighter he felt. He thought he could spread his arms and let the wind carry him from people who did nothing but work and eat and sleep and knew of nothing except birth and life and death. When his brothers saw his wistful smile, they frowned. One of them always said, Ho, stay at home. You've wasted another day. How many prayers will that flower or bird or tree buy for our dead father? When will you set aside your fine clothes and work beside us in your loincloth? Good question, my wife said. You're supposed to be fixing the up stairs toilet and here you are spinning stories. Someone has to, I tell her. Where would we be without? Sweetie, she said, that same someone promised to spend the first week of his holidays during chores. Can't the story wait? Fixing toilets reminds me too much of work, I say. There's only so many times you can rewrite a cabinet document because before it starts sounding like fiction. When she says, don't make me laugh, I change the subject. So what do you think of that opening? Before she can reply, I admit it's not the original opening. This was. We have changed the names, but the land remains, and Fire Mountain rises as majestically as ever in what our fathers called the kingdom of the sun. Not once in our memories has the mountain erupted. But the last time its flames scorched the sky, it vented enough anger to topple the finest house in the kingdom. The mountain spirits rest now, weakened by their outpouring of rage, but they do not sleep. They only wait for us to forget the value of Omar's gift. That's terrible, she says. It's so la di da. I sit there smarting, but she's right as usual, and so I say, I suppose that's why my editor suggested I drop it. Later on, I realized I was simply writing my way into the story. It also gives away too much, she says. She's full of surprises, my wife. Her hair even changes color according to her moods. This morning, she awoke a strawberry blonde. Way too much, she adds. Do you know this story, I ask? I know you, she says. The day's too young to get into that, so I mutter, where was I? The brothers are wondering when Amar will start making himself useful. At this, he returned to earth. He felt clumsy and homely and chided himself for thinking his work could be any more than curiosities to such practical men. At first, he answered, I cannot work like you with heavy tools. Then he said, I do what I must. My wife snorts. Over the years, the brothers married and built their own houses. Lost in his carving, Amar never returned the teasing smiles of the village women, and so they laughed about him when they gathered at the well. He'll search for stones while his children starve, one woman said. Better to marry a merchant with fingers sold by money, said another, than a craftsman with no ambition. At this, his mother lost her patience. She scolded him in public. What has all this carving done except heap slivers and splinters under my eaves? 
Has it raised one stock of rice or helped your brothers pay my taxes? The house is so full of your precious creations, there's barely room for us to sleep. Should we hang from the rafters like bats? The crowd gathering in the street laughed. Shame reddened Amar's face. He snatched up his tools and a roughly hewn block of wood. But before he could retreat into the house, a stranger stepped from the crowd. What precious creations, he scoffed. What can there be of value in this sorry village? I'm from Makora. My name is Tambunan. Let me see. How dare you call our village sorry, the innkeeper asked. Don't we have the finest view in the kingdom of Fire Mountain? Clearly a merchant, the water bearer growled. Look at his huge belly and twitching fingers. He's no better than an untouchable, the scribe muttered. Untouchables bury us when we die. Merchants skin us alive. Unlike her neighbors, Omar's mother revered anyone who lived in a town. Lord Tambunan, she said, I was only jesting about my son's work. It's not really precious. You see, when he's not wandering the slopes of Fire Mountain or the shores of Moon Lake, he carves and polishes worthless curios. Please see for yourself. She bowed Tambunan into the house and began to make tea. How typical, my wife exclaims. The men are merchants or water bearers or scribes and the mother makes tea. It's that kind of story, I say. It said a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. No, it used to be set in medieval Japan, but I said it, so it set in, I changed it, so it set in Southeast Asia, somewhere, Indonesia, maybe. Frowning, she asks, aren't you the one who says the more specific a story is, the more universal it will feel? That's true, but my mentor didn't feel this didn't think this felt like a Japanese story, so he suggested I change the setting. Amar's name used to be Kobayashi. She says, your editor, your mentor, whose story is this anyway? You ask, I answer. I prefer Amar, she says. Where's that from? I asked my mother for some Indian names and I liked Amar. She suggested Tambunan for the merchant. I think it's Indonesian, but here's the best part. After I told this story in a school, one of the Indian girls said, Amar means deathless. You're still giving things away, my wife says. Then, wait a minute, you told this entire story in a school and they sat still for it? I told one part every Friday afternoon for a month. The children, well, they were pre-teens, tweenies, she said, couldn't wait for the next part. I try not to sound impatient. At the rate you're going, she says, I'm surprised it didn't take a whole year. Well, the mother's making tea for the merchant. Sigh. Amar showed him into the rooms in which the brothers had slept. One housed dogs and cats, horses and cows, even tigers and dragons. A second room was a brittle garden of flowers like jasmine and water lily. In a corner lay a branch covered with cherry blossoms. A third room held tiny people from every walk of life, from warrior to peasant to priest. Upon returning to the main room, Tambunan sank dreamily onto a mat. He accepted a cup from Amar's mother. The first sip restored his frown. Hmm, pretty little things, he said, but hardly precious. Your mother's right, they have no value. Still, why don't you let me take a sample from each room to Edoni? That's where I'm bound. I'll do my best to sell them. They're not for sale, Amar said. They're only for enjoyment. What? His mother snapped. My lord, he doesn't know what he's saying. Tambunan half closed his eyes to set her at ease. Then he beamed at Amar. Tell me, my friend, Tambunan asked, how will people in towns enjoy your work unless you sell it? You don't strike me as selfish. I'll make sure only the most appreciative buy your work not collectors of trinkets. In return, I'll keep a third, no, say a half of what they fetch. If you don't want to soil your fingers with silver, I can give you notes promising rice. You can give them to your mother if you wish. Don't you want to help her? Omar tried to say, of course. His mother silenced him with a glare. Silver will be fine, she told Tambunan. My other sons raise all the rice we need. 
They break their backs like their father did. She told Omar, think of all the prayers your work will buy for him. Would you squander a gift from the gods? Very well, he said. And so Tambunin resumed his journey to Edoni. He went by palanquin instead of by foot. On his lap lay three of Omar's carvings wrapped in cotton. Tambunin returned a week later with three pieces of silver, which he reverently placed in Omar's palm. Omar could not hide his disbelief. He gave the silver to his mother and three more carvings to Tambunin. This time he was bound for his home in Makura. That definitely sounds Japanese, my wife says, and Edone sounds a lot like Edo. Was that the old name for Tokyo? It might have been, I say, I don't remember. The class system sounds Japanese too. Peasants were higher than merchants in medieval Japan. How do you know such things? I do read, she says. I'm not sure changing a name here or there makes this story feel any less Japanese. Didn't you say once that the difference between an amateur and a professional is that an amateur's work gels too fast, while a professional stays fluid? Maybe this story gelled too fast, or maybe it took on a life of its own, I suggest. Have it your way, she says. Well, then what happened? Well, I say, if you insist. Poor foolish Amar, he knew nothing about rice except how to eat it, and even less about silver. Upon reaching Edoni with the first three carvings, Tambunin had taken lodgings at its finest inn. He let it be known that for one piece of silver, or the equivalent in notes, he would give a private viewing of the finest work in the kingdom. Between sunrise and sunset, a dozen of the town's wealthiest citizens visited the inn. All of them left with light hearts and glazed eyes. The following day, he sold the carvings, not to those who could pay the highest prices, but to those who would continue buying from him. He earned three pieces of gold, nine pieces of silver, and notes promising 30 bushels of rice. On his next journey to the village, he wore new clothes. His robe, though outwardly plain as the law demanded of merchants, was lined with brocade. Amar's mother oohed and awed. Amar guessed the source of Tambunin's wealth, but politely ignored it. He remained content knowing people gazed at his works and forgot their everyday cares while composing poetry or listening to the sound of one hand clap. At last his brothers left him alone while he sat carving. Women bowed when they passed on the way to the well. Still, it is the fate of the young that when they reach their goal, they fix their eyes on another. So it happened with Amar. His peace of mind lasted one winter and melted with the snow. Thank you very much, Ven. And uh, we've got one more, right? We do. Our final reader, last but not least, is Bernadette Wagner, who will be reading, reading from her book, The Dry Valley, uh, Poetry from Meridian Press. And she'll be accompanied by her partner, Jim Mitchell, on guitar. Can't wait. I want to begin with the acknowledgement that we stand on Treaty 4 land. And I want to thank the Cathedral Village Arts Festival and all the volunteers, especially the planning committee who put a year of organizing into it, to Radiant Press for this night, to Kimmy Beach, my fantastic editor, to Holly Friesen for the delicious cover art, to Tanya Woke for the beautiful book design, to the Saskatchewan Arts Board for funding, to Sage Hill and the Saskatchewan Writers Guild for teaching me to be a writer, to you, the audience, and to Jim, my husband, for being here with me today and for the past 30-some years. Seeking the poem In bending brome grass Near the first pine East side of the orchard A brown mouse scurries Away from footsteps Breathe Wind rustles leaves and my nerves. Alert, I see comfort 
in the poetry of sky, its lines stretching end to end, north to south, east to west, breathe. Flut flutter of swallow, cackle of crow, alarm of chickadees fill the air, be with each sense. Breathe. Soft stepping, two white-tailed deer dance. One passes the last pine, then sachets left into bush. The second, raising its antlered head, prances, brushing branches of white raspberries, crabapple, and Nanking cherry trees, picks up speed, leaps the fence, and races into the fallow field. Breathe. Watch worries leave on the rustling breeze. Walk the path lightly into silence at the sixth pine. Breathe. Sitting beneath boughs, away from hot sun, bring gratitude for earth, and honoring the hum of a common fly, let mind rest. Breathe. Mapping the poem. Hot perimenopausal afternoon. Sweaty sun pulsing love in me. Alongside, the silver-gray pasture floats. Inside, the A.C. cools. My sunlit arm, my chest, ruffles my hair. I am cool when we gather in the gallery. Our expressions witnessed as we interconnect with all beings. The confluence of creatures strung and hung among all that is now. We writers scratch ideas. Words meet paper. Art feeds art. Upcycled shears, wheat pasted with color and content. Long and narrow manifestations of beings called into presence through meditation and reverence. A guided practice of seeing, being, and creating. Representations of Artemis, Diana, Fauna, Gaia, Flora, Salacia, inhabitants of this place, this time beyond time, this moment fills two rooms. My creation is not yet hung. It's growing in me like a poem, not yet much more than a string of words, those lost on the tip of a tongue, not ready for expression, not yet a concept complete enough to explore. But I explored, brushwork urgently reminding me that the skills required for crafting poems do not necessarily transfer to painting on sheer fabric lying flat along two tables. Still, a narrative, winding and long like the creek, Wolverine, takes shape and leads me to the lake. Last mountain lake, long and lean, where innumerable generations of children splashed and feared, loved and revered. It's what I should have painted. Yes, should. The perfectionist's mantra. I can give rein to words. No, not words exactly. Perhaps more the languages. The language of the human and more than human beings that dwell in our spheres. Known and unknown. Visible to the naked eye. Or 
more microscopic wavelengths of energy moving in and around us. The beings hanging in confluence among us, all welcome, all here, to witness, not fear, but the fearlessness as necessary as breath to give oneself over to the otherness that can be found in the throes of creation. And not just the otherness of the everyday artist's practice, kind of angst, but the deep down, deliciously dirty work of revealing the bones, the what's holding me here, up on this walk around the block with your sweater over my arm. Pulling Jim back in for this one. Field Notes from the Capel in memory of Robert Crouch. Morning bursts apricot and yellow on the lake. Gray driftwood floats on sky. White sails, a blue breeze. Water gurgles, chugs. Beeps announce coffee. This place allows for human and more than human connection. Wings, skin, bark, fur coexist. Just around the bend, maybe three miles north, somewhere between the hills, hanging in a mist that curves around land and heart. Insistent wind holds hawk high. She swoops, drops, then climbs, feast tightly taloned, soars over trees, birds, insect, over chattering squirrels, water, blood. Number 11 Highway, two blades slicing skin. How progress scalped this valley. Two turkey vultures spiral high, closer, closer to the hillside abattoir. Orange-breasted robin pecks apart huge moth. Families of swallows inhaling insects dip, rise, dip again. Coppell Valley green is silver sage, a treetop's lime, riverbank hay, market garden crops, stands of spruce stretching, short commercial lawn, see a forest holding a hill, a yellow clover stalk, Living sky shapeshifts colors, a river of vulnerability pinpricked by light. Peace filters through singing elms beneath their fluttering gold, rippling grasses. We've got one more for you. It's one of my favorites. Love song for Emma. Oh, Emma, in your presence, I lose language, my composure. Generations of longing well up, race my pulse until I swoon and fall. Oh, Emma, catch me. Emma, 
how you shine. A sunset of colors, bleeding yellow-orange to gold, blue and green playing to teal, while turquoise commingles with melon, magenta, cerise. Oh, Emma, you blind me! Emma, how you move. Your S's incite me. Your swerves and your curves, they delight me. Moon rays ripple on water. Night sneaks outside in. Oh, Emma, dance me! run dark and deep let me be the secret you keep yield your darkness share your wild self that animal beauty your curvaceous body that love energy then lift me Emma beyond all heights oh Emma let me plunge your depths, ride us to rapture. Oh, Emma. Oh. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Radiant. Thanks, everyone. We're Bernadette and Jim. Thank you, Bernadette and Jim. Well, Emma, I guess that's it. It brings us to the close of uh, Radiant Press's uh, contribution to the Cathedral Village Arts Festival virtual edition. Uh, we really appreciate everyone tuning in and and watching. And hopefully, you know, maybe next year we'll do it live again. That would be good. All right. Take in more events um, happening all this week and. Check out radiantpress.ca. Buy all the books. Right. And get your 50-50 tickets. All right. And stay safe. Bye. 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 Leave so long. Well, we can probably work with that. What do you think? Yeah.